All right. Now that we've reviewed the background for like the, the general transfer functions for LTI systems and all those things, now let's focus on circuits and see what we can do. So let's start with circuits that are what we call first order. In other words, they have one independent energy storage element. Or even more accurately, we, they have one uh, initial condition that can be defined. Right? If you can define one initial condition or you have one active element, one reactive element, that circuit in general can be defi defined as a first order response. And we know this from the basic elementary circuit network theory. So let's think about, so we have this box, right? And let's say this box, you can have an input X or Y, we've had this box view, or you can, sometimes you call it UI and UO for the input and output in general. U can be a voltage or a current, and so it can be input current II or O, V, I, or whatever. Now, and then let's imagine that you have one energy storage element. So if you have one energy storage element, what you can do is that you can think of this energy storage element, you can take it out, let's call it C1, right? Or it could be equivalently an L1, if it's an, in, if it's a, or it could be an inductor, right? So this is X and Y. And take it, this element out, and you can say, this element L1 is sitting here at this port, if you will. You can define a port. Wherever it's connected, you can connect it that way. And you say, look, if, if I take this out, everything else, this is a network with no dynamics. Network with no dynamics. So it has no energy storage element inside that brown bubble, right? No dynamics, let's say. Which means that it can still be a very complex circuit. Essentially, all the circuits we've talked about so far, anything, all of them, it can be as complex as it can be 5,000 transistors inside this thing. Or it, basically, when we say the linear model of a transistor, right? Because it's an LTI, we're right now with assumptions. So it can have all sorts of resistors, it can have all sorts of dependent sources, independent sources connected across in any arbitrary way. The only constraint is that there are no capacitors or inductors. There's no energy storage element inside them. Whatever, we ha whichever one of those you have, we put them outside. And then we, when we go to higher order versions of this thing, you will see that there will be multiple ones attached to it. So with that view, let's start determining what the transfer function of this thing would be. Now, and like I said, UI and UO can be voltages or currents or things of that sort. So now, in general, what is the most complex thing this can be? How many poles and how many zeros this can have? Why no, po no, no poles? What you one pole and one zero, right, in general. The most general form of the transfer function of something like this, H of S, would be A0 plus A1S over 1 plus B1S, a special form of that general transform, yeah, right? There are really, this is the most general can be. Now you may say, oh, it may have no zero. Well, it, when, we, when it has no zero, really, what, what, what we mean really is that the zero is at infinity, right? So for example, if A1 is zero, that means that the zero is at infinity, right? And if, for example, instead A0 was zero, what would tell you, that tell you about the location of the zero? It's at zero, right? It's a zero at zero. Right? So, but you can define anything in between them. And what you see from this expression is something important, actually. How many unknowns are there for any arbitrary network that you need to determine? Three for the first order network, right? So there are three numbers that if you knew, you would know everything there is to know about this network, this LTI, first order LTI network, right? A0, A1, and B1. So what we are going to develop, what we are going to do now in the next few minutes, is a way of calculating these three and writing this in a very, more in, intuitive way, rewriting this expression, that would give you a way to calculate these three with three low-frequency calculations. 
So this way you can find a transfer function of any first order system, and then we'll, later on we'll see that this can be generalized to any nth order system, with doing three low frequency calculations to determine these three. Right? One of them is pretty simple. For, I mean, let, let's, let's talk about A0. Let's start with that. Let's get warmed up on that. Can you think of a, 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 a way of measuring A0, determining A0? by some modification to this network and measure and, and doing a low frequency calculation. Yeah, replace a capacitor with an open or inductor with a short. Or another way to say the same thing is that set the value of the capacitor to zero or set the value of the inductor to zero. So do you agree that A, A0, so A0, do you agree it's h of s for c1 being 0, or l1 being 0. So what do you do? You, like you said, exactly. The way you do it is basically you open circuit the capacitor. You pretend it's not there. And you determine the transfer function of the circuit. And we'll do examples for you to, to see that, right? But you just determine the transfer function of the system when c1 is 0. And it's a low frequency calculation because there's other than the C, there was no dynamics in the circuit, right? So it's going to be a low frequency calculation similar to the calculations we've done so far. So you can calculate that. And whatever that is, we use. So, so it becomes H1. Now, we give this a new name or a new symbol because this, will, this kind of symbols will help us do. So, so this is something a little, it takes a little bit of getting used to. So let's get used to it. We will call this H superscript zero. Now, we'll be using superscripts here. I mean, in this part of derivation, anything you see up there is a superscript, is an index, is not a power. So this is not one, <laughs> right? This is H zero, H superscript zero. And in general, whatever is in the superscript is, so now I'm gonna say it and we'll, see it many, many times in many examples, but if you want to know what the superscript refers to is this. The superscript is the index of the element or elements that are being infinite valued. If that doesn't make any sense to you now, don't worry, I'll explain it in detail. Because right now what we did Z is zero valued, right? We set this value to zero. So basically when it's zero, it means that nobody is infinite valued. Everyone is zero valued. But then whatever is in the, in the superscript is if other than, if it's zero, it means that nobody is infinite valued. If I said H1, you can imagine it means that elements with index one is infinite valued. And we'll see how that enters the equation in a minute. But that's the essence. So we've determined one already, right? H0, or A0, right? We've determined this one. What can you say about B1? For a, this is a first order system, right? In a first order system, let's say for the capacitor for now, and then we'll talk about the inductor in a second. Um, let's say you had a capacitor attached to some sort of a linear network. What determines the pole frequency? B1 is the pole frequency, right? I mean, or one over pole frequency, right? Or negative one over pole frequency, more accurate. What determines this thing? What determines the, where the pole is, where this B1 is? There's something there, right? We talk a lot about when, what is the one parameter that determines the first order system's response, for example? The, the time constant, right? If it's a capacitor, if it's a capacitor, it would be an RC time constant. Or if it's an inductor, it's L over R time constant. But it's a time constant, right? So we know from the first order system analysis that this part of the response, this B1 is the time constant, right? So we know that B1 is the time constant, which in this case would be what? Would be C1 times something. What is that something? The resistance. What resistance exactly, right? The resistance that you see across here, across this port, this resistance, right? We'll call it R superscript zero, or you could call it R1 superscript zero. 
subscript one because it's associated with element one. But we, are, we have only one element for now, so we, don't, we may drop that R subscript one in your, in your handout. I think I've dropped it for this part. But again, you can write it as R10 or just R superscript zero. So that's R10 or R, or you can write it this way for now, because you only have one element. If you have more elements, then you have to worry about which one is which, right? So that resistance, how do you calculate it? What's the mechanism for calculating it? It's a port resistance, right? You did a problem set on this, right? You remember earlier on? It basically is, how do you when you calculate it, there's one thing you need to do. You need to null all independent sources for calculating a port resistance, right? Including your input. So you null everything, including your input, because that's part of the independent sources that you have. Now, if this input was a voltage source, nulling it would make it short circuit. If this input was a current source, it would make it an open circuit. And you can see that the time constants will change. And we talked about this, that the poles will change if you switch a current source drive to a voltage source drive, if they don't have a source impedance. One way to avoid that, for example, would be to instead, if you have a voltage source drive that is in series with some resistance, let's say, I don't know, X ohms, let's say eight ohms, right? You can also have a current source drive in parallel with eight ohms, basically the Thevenin or Norton equivalents. And if you have something like this that drives this port, then it wouldn't matter whether it's current or voltage. Because when you null it, this kind of short, it becomes an eight ohm. When you null it, this becomes an open, it becomes an eight ohm to ground. The same thing. But, so that's why this is important. But if you have an ideal drive just going straight into a port, you have to be careful what you put in there. Anyway, OK, so let's continue. So B1 is determined really by this. Now, one of the things that's, so we know this here. So, the, so we've determined two of the three constants, right, that we needed to determine. There's only one left, A1. So what is A1? How do we determine A1? Well, we notice something. For in the case of a capacitor, for example, let's say for the capacitive network, we know where, does the, where do these S's come from? What, ter, what element generates these S's, these frequency dependents? The capacitor. the capacitor, right? The only element that can have an S. How does it generate it? So for example, the impedance of a capacitor is you know, 1 over Cs, right? Or its reactance is. C1S. So you can see the C and S always go together, right? So since it's coming from that element, the C and S should be always come in a multiplicative pair. So I can rewrite this. So what, I'm, what we are trying to do is to derive H1. So this, these arguments are arguments to a derivation of H, uh, sorry, A1, which would be H1, uh, tau1, but anyway. Uh, okay. So, so we are trying to derive that. So what we can do, we can rewrite this slightly differently. We can say, look, let me just get rid of these. We can say, hey, you know, H of S is, I know it's this thing, A0 or H0, plus, now, I know that whatever, this, this is in front of this thing. This should have a multiplicative C factor at least. Because it was generated by some sort of a CS. So instead, I write it as alpha 1, 1, um, C1, S. And so it's the same thing for the denominator. Beta 1, 1, it's just one parameter, right? C1, S. So do you agree that it can be written? It should be able, we should be able to write it this way, by that argument, right? So what is the value of H of S when S goes to infinity? I'm sorry, when C goes to infinity, not S. C goes to infinity. So let's find out. H of S when C1 goes to infinity. What is it? Alpha 1, 1, alpha one, one over beta 1, 1, right? Alpha 1, 1 over beta 1, 1. But let me ask you another question. What is beta 1, 1? R10, right? So we know that beta11 from here, we know it's, it's R10. Now, 
This thing we call H superscript 1. We define H superscript 1 or H1 as that, which basically makes sense in the light of what we said a few minutes ago, right? The superscript is the index of what is being infinite valued. So element 1 is being infinite valued. It's set to infinity. So now element 1 is being set to infinity. Therefore, what it does, it basically, it, but it, this is h11 defined. And when you do that, you get this. So which basically now you can show to be alpha11 over r10. Right? Because of this. From the, the only thing that's unknown here is alpha 1, 1 in terms of, you can define alpha 1, 1 in terms of H1. So you can write this alpha 1, 1 is R10, or let's write this, H superscript 1, R10. So if I plug this back into here, what do we get? I will get, so now A1 was H0, alpha 1, 1 is H1 r10 times c1 s over 1 plus, and then this is r10, r10 c1 s. Right? Yes? Sorry? How got the beta 1 1? I looked at, look back at this, right? We determined this already, right? This was B1S. So the denominator is B1S, but B1 is now beta 1, 1, C1. So since the C1 is already there, so what's the word left of it is the basically R11, right? Because this product is this product, C1 is there, so beta 1, 1 of it should be just R10, right? Okay, so now you can see this thing, right? And so you, can, you can write it this way, or even better, you can write it this way. So we can say h of s equals h0 plus h1 tau s divided by 1 plus tau s. So this is the expression that we'll be using. So now you can see that there are three parameters. I mean, they're slightly different order differently, but there are three parameters that determine the first order system in, in its entirety, right? It's time constant, which is determined by looking at the resistance that you see across the port. Now, if it's an inductor, the time constant would be different. So in the case of an inductor, this would be uh, basically, for example, L1 over R10, but the rest of the derivation would remain similar. And you get to the same point, same result. If you write it, the beauty of writing in terms of tau is that it basically is independent of whether it's inductor or capacitor. It works for both. Right? So what you do is says, okay, you need to calculate, you need to find the time constant by, no, by, by removing the element, looking at the resistance that you see here, nulling all the independent sources looking at that resistance. If it's an inductor, it would be L over that, and if it's a capacitor, it would be L times that. Now, you also need to determine these two. These are what we call transfer constants. And you can see why. These are time constants, right? This is a transfer constant, because these are just transfer functions determined at a certain setting. So it's a low frequency transfer characteristic or transfer function, it's like those gains. But they're two different values, right? One is the transfer function or the gain, the low frequency gain from this input to that output when this capacitor is open, that's H0. The other one is the gain from this term, low frequency gain from this input to that output when the capacitor is shorted or infinite value. For the inductor, it would be the opposite. For the inductor, it would be H0 would be the, the gain from this terminal to that terminal when the inductor is shorted, because that's when it's zero valued. Is shorted, and it would be the gain from this terminal to that terminal when the inductor is open. So you can see that, but just you manipulate the, the active elements, you either short them or open them, and you get a bunch of different gains, so it becomes three simple calculations. So you don't have to write the, the, the objective, and this method will allow you to do that, is to never have to write KCL and KVL, or nodal analysis. 
Only you would do it if you want to verify some theoretical things or just verify something that to show something, that some pathological cases and all those things. You need to have that tool, but you don't use it. Okay, so, do, do, so does it make sense? Any questions on the derivation? Let me see if there are any additional notes that I wanted to make about this. Uh, Cover that stuff. Okay, good. So let's do a few examples. Let's do a few examples of this thing to see if it actually, how it works. So again, since this is quite important, I will repeat it down here just for our audience at home. Okay, so let's do first example. The first exa let's pick a very simple example, some basic examples that we know exactly how they are supposed to operate. And, and work. so, example one. Let's do a basic RC circuit, first order RC, with a voltage source input. So this is V in, and this is V out. This is C, this is R. Let's call it C1. Let's call it, I don't know, R1 or R. OK? We know the transfer function of this thing, right? We all do, I suppose. But OK, let's find out what those parameters are. So what is H0? How do we determine H0? We zero value element. Of basically all elements, and look at what you get from the input. So if this is zero value, meaning the capacitor is open circuited, what's the relationship between V out and V in? There will be no current flowing through this resistor, so there will be no voltage drop across this, so this voltage has to be the same as that voltage, right? One. So the ratio of the output to input, it's one. Right? What is tau? It should really be tau one, but because there's element one. So how do we know it's RC? We remove this. We look at where it was connected. We null all the independent sources. Nulling a voltage source does what? Short circuits. So you have this resistor R to ground. So what do you see looking into here? You see R between these two. So you, and then you have multiplied that. So R, C1. Right? What is H1? So how do we determine H1? The superscript is the index of the element that's infinite valued. A capacitor that's infinite valued is short circuited. If I short circuit the capacitor across here, what is my V out to V in ratio? Well, V out is going to be zero. So V out to V, out to v in ratio is going to be uh, what? Zero. So what does it generate in, if, you, if I plug it into that equation? So let's say H of S would become one. The second term is 0 over 1 plus RC1S, which is the transfer function of that thing. Right? Let me put it down here to give myself more room. So pretty straightforward, right? Now let's do another one. Let's do one where we um, do a high pass. Or, so let's say, well, um, okay, now here let's say you have an R1, an R2, and then you have a C1, you have a input voltage source like that, and this is your V out, so this is V in. R1 and R2, oh, I'll call them RA and RB. Okay, so let's use them RA and RB. RA and RB. So now what's the transfer function of this thing? Well, we can calculate it using the same method, right? So what is H0? What, how do we evaluate it? When we set value of the capacitor to zero, right? We, we open circuit it. 
so it becomes open circuit. So what is the V out to V in ratio here? RB over RB. Yeah, RB over RB, RA plus RB. It's a voltage divider, right? It's RB over RA plus RB. Now, what is tau 1? Well, we, what do we do? We null all, remove the capacitor, of course. We look at where it's connected. Oh, zero value, everything is zero valued now. Now, and null the independent source. So what, what do you see if you null the independent source? What is the resistance you will see? If you null the independent source, you've shorted these two. So these two resistors will be in parallel, right? So what do you see? RA parallel RB. RA parallel RB times C, right? C1, which is basically you can also write as RA RB over RA plus RB C1. This is the preferred form. But sometimes if you, you will see that if you need to do some algebraic manipulations, it may simplify it if you expand it. But generally, if you don't have any good reason to do it, just I would keep it in this form the low entropy form after late Professor Middlebrook. OK. Now, and then, oh, did I say? Yeah, OK. And then H1. What is H1? The, the only thing that's left, there are three low frequency calculations. So H1. What is H1? What do we need, what do we need to do for H1? Infinite value element number one, because it's in the superscript, right? So when I sh infinite value C1, I've shorted it. What happens? What is the, the input and output are shorter to each other. So what is that ratio? One. The good news about this method is that actually as you start short circuiting stuff, things become simpler to calculate often. Because a lot of things are just like removed. They're being short circuits across. So what do you see now? So let's, let's calculate the H of S. So this one, so I can factor this thing out now, right? I mean, I, we can write it as H0, but I can basically factor, because that's my DC gain. If I factor that, then what do I get in the, what do we, what do we get in the numerator? In the numerator, we had this times that times S. If we factor this term out, which is this term, what are we left with? you get a 1 plus RAC1S, right? And in the denominator, what do you get? You get 1 plus RA parallel RB C1S. So this is a useful form, because the right-hand side of it goes to 1 at zero frequency. Right? It shows you the zero frequency, the frequency of the zero and the frequency of the pole and the low frequency gain. Right? So it works nicely for these kind of simplified resistive networks and all those things. Of course, it works for other things too. But let me just do one more uh, resistive network for you. Let's do one in, in, in an inductor, just to get comfortable with those. Um, and then we'll do a bunch of transistor. I mean, we'll be doing a lot of the transistor-based ones based on using this method. But um, So example three. Um, let's say you have one. Let's do one with an inductor. So this is your V in. R, L. And let's say this is your V out. Okay. Let's do what is H zero? Well, how do we calculate H zero? Everything is zero valued. And a zero valued inductor is what? Short. Is a short circuit. So what do you get? What you have short circuited the output to input, right? I mean no to ground, not to input, to, 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 to ground. Which basically gives you what? Zero. So the output to input ratio is going to be zero. So H zero is zero. Now, what is the tau? What is the time constant? So null all the independent sources, and look what you see from looking here. If you null this all the independent sources, what do you see? 
This is short-circuited. You look at, look, you're looking across here, you see R. So what is the time constant? L over R, right? Because for inductors, L over that R. OK? And then what is H1? Well, your infinite value L, element 1, say L1, right? Element 1 is infinite value. When it's infinite, it's what's an infinite valued inductor? Open. open. So what is the transfer function if this is open? Voltage, this voltage to that voltage if this is open? One. one, right? Because it's just basically there's no current through the resistor, so the voltage across it is zero. So this voltage and that voltage are the same. So this transfer function is one. So what is the transfer function? H of s is zero plus h1, which is one, times the time constant L over R, L1 over R, S divided by one plus L1 over R S. What does it generate? An inverse pole, or a zero at zero and a pole at whatever frequency, right? And its transfer function looks like this. So, so I, I didn't do the transfer, we didn't do the transfer functions for this, right? The transfer function looks like that. This is basically uh, R over, or one over tau, tau. Log of omega, so this would be log of that really. But, right? And here, what's the transfer function? What did, what did this one look like? We did, I forgot to do that. See, there's a pole and a zero, so there is a transfer, so, so you have, at, at zero, you have a constant gain, right? Which is R less than one. It's RB over R, RB plus RA at low frequencies. And then what happens is that you have a zero and a pole, so it kind of goes up and then becomes flat again, right? What is the final value? One, one right? Well, we already know. Right? So it goes really from H0 to H1. If you look at it here, it's also going from H0, which is 0, to H1, which is 1. The Bode plot goes from H0 to H1 for this first order one. And for this one, of course, you had, I forgot to do all of these, but here. So basically you have a single pole. So you can actually, what you're doing here is that, so this is a pole, and you just pull it. The frequency is basically one over tau. The angular frequency is one over tau. Right, so. Now, this you can actually think about as an inverse pole, if you want. It makes, you, it, makes it easier to manipulate. If, we, if the, those, the notion of an inverse pole and inverse zero bothers you, you can think about it as a pole here and a zero at zero frequency, which on a log axis will appear at negative infinity. Okay? Any questions so far? Are these clear? What do you think will happen um, beyond that? I mean, just like at, at a higher number of poles and zeros. Well, you have a superposition of sources. We don't have superposition of components, right? This is actually a very good point of discussion. There is no reason for components to, to have superpositions. And actually, they don't. So we'll have to see what happens to them. Superposition applies to stimuli, not element. It's something to think about. All right, so let's do a transistor one. Let's do a basic one based on a transistor, and we'll expand it. So what we have here is a, uh, um, let's do a simple, let's do a simple one first. Let's say you have a uh, common emitter. So you have an RL, or let's call it R2, and you have an R1, the source resistance R1, and then you have a source voltage V in. And then let's say you only worry about the C pi. So let's say you have right now, because, well, because you only know how to do first order so far. Let's just worry about one element. We'll, see, we'll add those other ones and see how this, then we learn how to do second order. We'll do that. But let's worry about that now. So this is C pi. Okay? 
what is this, uh, what is the impact of that C pi capacitance on the bandwidth of this thing? Well, we can always draw the small signal model. For this one, we know, we said that when your emitter or your source is grounded, the pi model works better. It makes it easier. I mean, again, this is a rule of thumb. You can, you're welcome to use the T model or pi model, whatever you want. So if you look at that, you have an R pi here, you have a V in, and then you have an R1. And then what you have here on the other side, you have the GMV pi. Let's forget about RO. If you had an RO, we could absorb it into R2 in this calculation. So there's, we don't worry about it. R2 would be RO parallel with whatever RL you have. But so that's the model, right? And where's the capacitor? The capacitor is sitting here, C pi. OK, let's find out what the um, effect of C pi is. So we need to find the transfer function for this, right? So there are, again, there are three calculations, the three calculations. So what is H0? Well, H0 is the value when the capacitance 0, C1, C1, C pi in this case, is uh, 0, right? So if it's 0, basically it's one of those basic low frequency calculations that we have. What is the gain? Well, the gain is the voltage gain from here to there and the voltage gain from here to there, right? The voltage gain from here to there is what? It's a voltage divider, right? R pi over R1 plus R pi. So what we get is R pi plus over R1 plus R pi times the gain from here to there, which is what? Minus GMRL, right? Or R2, minus GMR2. If you want, you can simplify. This is beta, right? GMR pi is beta, because R pi is beta RM. But again, let's, let's keep it the way it is for now. Now, OK, so that's one. What if, what if, what is the effect of the, so, so what's the time constant? Well, we need to null all the independent sources and see what is the resistance seen by the capacitor, where the capacitor is connected. What do, what do you see when you do that? Yeah, you see the parallel combination of these two resistors, right? Because if you sh null this, it's going to short circuit it to ground. So this side is going to be ground. This is ground. So these two are in parallel, right? So this is going to be R1 parallel R pi times C pi. And what is, so now, now you look at my notation, and this should not surprise you. What should I call this? Make sense? It's the index of the one that's the active element, right? I mean, if I sometimes may call, if I, I may call it also h1, but it's really h pi. I mean, this is the index of this thing, whatever that is called. So h pi is what? Is the transfer function when c pi is infinite valued, right? What is the value? What is h pi? It's actually a very simple constant. Is that, is that? Are you sure? If I short circuit this to ground here, zero. right? Nothing's going to go through anymore, right? So it's zero. Right? So done. We're done. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we are done here. We don't even need to express the transfer function like that. If you want to, you can. So basically, what? The, the, the cleanest form of writing that transfer function really is writing h of s is h0 over 1 plus tau s. Right? And we know h0 is this and tau s is tau, whatever, is that. Instead of like writing these massive expressions, useless massive expressions. The whole point is to write it in a simple enough form that we can see what the insight is. We don't want to kind of tie our hands behind ourselves and shackle our feet just like and go and try to kind of do something. We want to have some simple forms that we can see. So yes, it's a first order response. It has one pole and no zero, or a zero at infinity. We call it no zero, right? 
from this picture, from this equation, can you tell me, a, can we come up, so this is the last thing we're going to do for today, but just can you give me an example, and we'll do a lot more examples of this next time, next lecture, but um, can you give me an, a simple way to find out if I have a zero or not? Can you define a simple test of whether or not there's a zero in the transfer function of at least the first order system? We'll see the generalized test too later on, but what is the test? Yeah. If h1 is 0, there is no 0, right? So what does that, what, it translate it to something even more circuity, right? Circuity. Yeah? My capacitor can inhibit that, but something that couples the inhibition. Yeah, if there is an element, okay, that you can, well, if there's a capacitor, you can short circuit, or an inductor, you can open circuit, that would produce a non-zero output then you will have a zero, right? So for example, let me say, instead of this guy, if I had, if you had this capacitor, we'll do this one next lecture, but if, if you had that, what would you get? You, you have an, so if you didn't have this, you had just that, right? Now, if you short circuit this capacitor, you have a non-zero transfer constant. If you have a non-zero transfer constant for an element that's short circuit, or, or infinite value more accurately, but for capacitor it would be short circuited, or an inductor that's open circuited, then that's the test that you have a zero. In fact, you can even tell what the, which half plane the zero is in. If it's a left half plane or right half plane zero. What's, that, what's the test for that? Devise the test from looking at that equation. Basically, you want to see if this is, that sign is, H1 is positive or negative, right? If H1 is positive, it's a left half plane. It's a negative zero. If it, H1 is pos negative, it's a right half plane, right? How do we determine that? Well, it's not really exactly H1. It's really the zero frequency is this, because you have to factor this. It's really H1 over H0 tau s, right? So that's the zero. So it's the sign of this thing that matters. So the simple test is if shorting, shortening of this capacitor flips the polarity of the gain, it's a right half plane zero. And if it doesn't, it's a left half plane zero. So is this a left half plane zero or right half plane zero? Does it flip the polarity or not? This is a... What's the gain from here to there, or from the beginning? It's a negative, right? If I short circuit this, would, it, would the gain be negative or positive now? Positive, right? Because it just goes, signal goes straight through. So it does flip the polarity of the gain, and hence it is a right half plane zero. We'll talk about this more extensively later, but just, you can see that they can tell a lot if you think about that expression properly. Okay, any questions? All right.